Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Isaiah Alexander. I am the assistant programmer of the 2021 Prideful series, and I will be your moderator tonight. Quick disclaimer, if you hear explosions in the background, it's because we're celebrating Diwali and my neighbors are setting off fireworks. So to briefly describe myself in audio, I am a black man, I'm African descent. I have caramel skin, medium brown, short curly hair. I am wearing a white t-shirt with a silver chain. I'm sitting on a gray office chair in my bedroom and the walls are white. So welcome to the Peer Kids Virtual Q&A co-presented with DCTV. We have a very exciting panel for you tonight. We are joined by the director of Peer Kids, Elegance Bratton, the producer of Peer Kids, Chester Gordon, and we also have with us Vanessa Viscara, who is an LGBTQ service coordinator at P PFY. Corey Dosti is live captioning tonight's event and Benny Yamas is doing the ASL interpretation. Prideful is a film screening series by and for queer and trans people of color or QTPOC. We strive for, to provide an open safe space for the QTPOC community and especially for those who are filmmakers, artists and arts lovers. The 2021 Prideful series includes a panel talk, 10 films and a Q&A, all available virtually. The theme of this year's series is Stories of Queer Diasporas, The Journey in Search of Blank, bringing a timely yet universal conversation about migration, immigration, and alienation in queer diasporas. Good news for anyone who still hasn't caught the magic that is Peer Kids. You can still watch Peer Kids within the next four hours. And tomorrow we open The Journey of Mona Lisa and No Hard Feelings for streaming. To get tickets and information, please check out our socials at Prideful Film, that's P-R-I-D-E-F-U-L-L-F-I-L-M, or our website, prideful.org, with double L's. Before we start, I'd like to introduce our co-presenter tonight, Dara Messenger from DCTV. Dara, I invite you to say a few words, starting with a description of yourself and your background. Hi everyone, my name is Tara Messenger. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman uh, with brown, a brown bob, um, wearing an olive v-neck sweater. And I have my background blurred because I'm in a messy room as I have a friend staying here from Germany right now and he's been sleeping in my office. So um, I am DCTV's director of programming. Um, we're so happy to co-present this film and discussion with Prideful. Um, for those of you that might not know DCTV, we uh, were founded in 1972 and we're one of the nation's oldest and most honored nonprofit media arts centers where community screenings and discussions, youth media and continuing education programs and affordable filmmaking resources all exist side by side with DCTV's own award-winning documentary productions. And uh, we're based in Chinatown, NYC. And next year, um, we will see to a project uh, very near and dear to us coming to life. Uh, we have built a documentary cinema uh, featuring, that will feature premieres, uh, uh, first run theatrical debuts, curated series, repertory programs, um, senior and family programs. Um, 74 seats, ADA accessible, Academy Award qualifying, um, an adjoining event space, we're really thrilled. Um, so hopefully we get to, to screen Elegance's latest film um, there. Uh, so, so yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dara. Uh, so because this is a shorter event, we ask you to type your questions in the Q&A box instead of the chat box as the panel is happening, and we'll try to answer them coming down to the end of the program. Also, you can choose to uh, verbally speak your questions by clicking the raise your hand button and my colleague Nabin will give you access to turn on your video and speak. 
Please also note that this event is being recorded and will be shared to the public. If you have any questions about the program or are having technical issues, please ask the Prideville team in the chat box or the Q&A box and Navin and I will answer them. So to start, I'd like to introduce everyone and have you describe yourself audibly. So I'm going to start with Elegance and Chester. Hi, I'm Elegance Bratton, writer director of Peer Kids. Um, I am a tall, dark, handsome <laughs> black man. <laughs> and uh, I've got a gap in my teeth. I'm wearing a vaguely gynecological punk rock long sleeve t shirt. And um, yeah, that's me. I am Chester. I am a non-binary femme that's like everything. And I have cornrows in my hair right now. I want a pair of like really thick, uh, clear translucent glasses. I have a septum in my ear. I have a goatee and mustache. I also have a choker on with a metal clasp. I also have on a black and white uh, punk rock shirt from Search and Destroy. And I have on silver earrings and I am black. I forgot that I should have said that first. <laughs> Very important. And I'm brown. Vanessa. <laughs> Vanessa. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Vanessa Viscara. I am a feminine presenting person. I have long black hair with a little bit of blonde at the end. Hopefully, it's still there. I wear glasses. I'm currently wearing a black crew neck shirt or black long sleeve. What is it called? Yeah, good shirt. Uh, with a corduroy dress on top of it. I'm currently in a white room with a purple clock to my left hand side, sitting in my office chair. Um, yeah, that's me. I use she, they pronouns. Thank you. Thank you so much for those very descriptive descriptions. So, to start it off, I want to kick these questions to Elegance and Chester, since you guys are both in the same room. Uh, I want to know how you two got into both producing and directing. Yeah, I guess I'm sorry. I, I moved to New York with just like a dream and my unemployment checks. And I started, uh, I like wrote a makeup artist named Alyssa Yona I asked her to like assist her during a fashion week and she gave me a job. I did that a week later, I started interning for Heather Law and a Canadian designer in Jules Wood, a fashion stylist, and they both hired me. Heather is head of her production, Jules is her stylist assistant. I did that for about a year, then started like, well, during that time, started styling my own things. And I ran into the new Otomo Bedomo in the park one day, uh, 14th Street in New York, uh, Union Square. And she stopped me and was like, hey, we're looking for black people to go to New Jersey. And I'm like, I looked at her and I looked at the van. I was like, maybe this is like a kidnapping. I don't know. And she, <laughs> you know I'm like, where are we going? And she's like, we're shooting a movie and DeAndre Force is in the back. And DeAndre was like a model who I love. So I got in the car, did it. And it turned out that Nuatama at that time was a grad student at NYU, the school that Elegance would go to a year later. And I would meet Elegance and I did Afronauts. Afronauts ended up playing all these film festivals. My face was everywhere. And um, then I met Elegance. When Elegance was at NYU, when we met, he it was a year before he started NYU in grad school. And was when he was in, summer it was the summer before. Oh yeah, it was the summer before. Mm -hmm. I'm like, uh, you know, I'm just, you know, yeah. exaggerating. But anyway, he, no one would make his, no, none of the producers that were in the program with him at NYU, you know, film school is set up that people go there for directing. You get into school for directing, writing, producing, um, or whatever you get in for. And no one would produce for him. And no one would like, they didn't think that his stories were worth producing because he wanted to tell a bunch of queer stories when he first got there, specifically that had to do with his experience. And um, they didn't see that as valuable and they didn't think that it would get into a lot of festivals or, you know, it would, you know, do the things that they wanted to do with. Yeah, their... yeah, yeah, yeah. And 
I decided to I decided to produce it. And at the same time I did that, I started I started helping with the second year film. One of his friends, Raven uh, Jackson, who went to school, who was also in his class, asked me to costume her movie. And once she asked me to do that, Elegance like, well, you can't costume her movie without costuming my movie. I actually yeah. asked you to costume her <laughs> but, but you didn't show up. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, all of this, uh, <laughs> I ended up producing about like 30 of those films. And then I costume designed a couple of features and um, Pure Kids, a doc series on Viceland and a bunch of other stuff. But all through, you know, I guess stumbling into it, but using skills that I have from other jobs to, you know, get the things done. Yeah. Right, um, right, yeah. I came to filmmaking by way of a happy accident. Um, I was kicked out of my house when I was 16 for being gay. I spent 10 years homeless and then I joined the Marines and my um, recruiter suggested I become a filmmaker in the Marine Corps because he felt I was good at telling stories. Um, interestingly enough, when I was homeless, one of the ways that I made money was by stealing art books because they had really great resale value. So. And so when my recruiter was like, had you ever thought about being a filmmaker? I had read Spike Lee's book, Martin Scorsese's book, um, Jane Campion's book. So I kind of had daydreams about doing something, vague daydreams about doing something like this. And when the recruiter asked me, I said, sure, yeah, I want to be a director. Um, you know, fast forward, I get to the Marines and, you know, I'm a private in the Marine Corps. And this general calls me up to his office and this man prided himself on having control of two thirds of the earth's surface. You know, you walk into his office, it looks like Dr. Strangelove, his logo is all over the planet. And um, I'm like, what is this white man gonna talk to me for? And it turned out that he was writing a retirement ceremony and he needed me to review his script. And it was the first time, you know, a white straight man had ever asked my opinion about anything. And um, I, it kind of stuck. I was like, oh, wow. So if people think I'm a director, then they want to listen to me. So I made a bunch of documentaries for the Marines, actuality films, retirement ceremonies, a little bit of everything. Um, got out of the Marines, was about to get out of the Marines, got stationed in New York City. Couldn't be an artist for the Marines anymore, but I was in New York City, so I started experimenting, um, you know, shooting photography, like lookbooks for different fashion designers and uh, nightlife events and things of that nature. And one day when I was on my last military job, you know, I, my job was to be basically a security guard, like a military police officer. So I would check the ID of people coming into the base. And this guy came in, I, him and I just had a really bad relationship. I just, I thought he was so dumb. And he was just white, got meathead. And I'm just like, I'm straight. And I'm just like, what are you? He's just so dumb to me. I just didn't like him very much. And so, you know, one day, instead of having his military ID, he had a Columbia University ID. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, how did you get this? And he's like, well, I go to school there. I'm like, they wouldn't let you in that school. And he's like, I'm in the school. And he ended up taking me to his office and showing me all this paperwork. And I was like, if this idiot get into Columbia, I know I can get into Columbia. So I applied and I got in. And <laughs> um, I, when I got to Columbia, you know, Columbia was probably my 13th, 14th time trying to go to college after graduating from high school. And, you know, I didn't want it. Hold on. I didn't want it to fail again. I really wanted it to work for me. And one of the things that got me scared out of college was just being around people for whom the future was promised made me feel really insecure. So this time around, I, I realized I had to take ownership of my past in order to have a future. So I started studying African-American studies and anthropology. Um, and more importantly, I realized that you know, these kids at Columbia, they didn't grow up like I grew up. I grew up in a household where money was what we were about. We needed money to pay the bills. We had to make money. My mother counted every hour she worked and each one of those dollars had an afforded place. And then you get to a place like Columbia University and these kids have capital. They don't need money. They're, these are the children of the ruling class. And I had to ask myself, you know, what is it that I have that's capital? And I realized that my personal experience, being homeless, being black, being gay, that these are things that I had that nobody else in this environment had. And simultaneously, these are things that I have been kind of taught to be ashamed of my whole life. So in order to find a way to find power in my identity and my experience,
experience, I, um, I began making peer kids. I raised $50,000 from the students in my university. We shot 400 hours of footage, realized I didn't know how to make a, I knew how to shoot a movie, but I didn't know how to necessarily edit a movie. So with that 400 hours of footage, well, interestingly enough, I had a white producer in the beginning of Peer Kids who ended up losing his job after this, but he, uh, you know, he said to me, I'm going to apply to NYU grad film because I'm white and I'm straight and I'm making your movie and it's about all these black trans people and I'm going to get in. There's no way I don't get into a place like Tish making your film. Yeah. Like, and I was like, if this white man thinks he can get in a Tish with my idea, it's my idea. Of course I can get right. in a Tish. Yeah. So I applied and I got in and I began to make uh, narrative short films. And when I got to Tish, you know, at Columbia, we were doing a, a theoretical understanding of the ruling class and how it related to like media representation, art throughout history. These are things that really mattered to me. When I got to do NYU, 30% of my school year were billionaires. So now I'm with the ruling class as they imagine the other in real time. And like Chester said, you know, I, I coming from the background that I have come from, I wasn't really about trying to fit in with those people. I felt like what I had to offer was as compelling, if not more compelling than what they had to offer. So I started making short films. I made my first short called Walk For Me. The movie played, and, and that being said, Walk For Me is about a black trans girl who makes her femme queen debut in the ballroom scene. And her Which you, you and Chester also worked in that together, correct? That's what I'm about to say, yeah. So, you know, having this sort of a Black trans girl in the ballroom scene at Tish, they just did not value it. They felt like it was, people just didn't get it. Why would you do a movie with all Black trans people? These people aren't really actors, but a lot of things were said. So I found myself in a situation where more and more I was being isolated in the environment I paid to have support in. Mm -hmm. But fortunately enough, I met the love of my life who happens to be creatively aligned with me. And yet again, you know, it was another moment where I was like, hey, I need to dig into who I am and where I'm from rather than trying to appeal to something that isn't really necessarily for me. Yeah. Right. And right. what you know, Walk, you know, mm -hmm. and we made Walk For Me. It played about 250 festivals worldwide. It was, it was, a, it was for me, for Walk For Me, by the way, the biggest accomplishment of that movie is the first time it ever screened at NYU because they do this like yeah, screen. That was great. Every, like, you that know, their films and the entire ballroom scene, all the different generations, the icon legends, yes. the statements, the stars, they yeah. all showed up. Yeah. And when I tell you after the movie played- Before it, it played. Like, before it played. When my name came up, they When they came up, Walker B, they're like, ah! And then <laughs> like, when it was over, I mean, they stood up, it was rumbling, and yeah. everybody, they asked elegance at the end. Did you pay people to come here yeah. to yeah. cheer for your movie? <laughs> and I was like, no, I didn't. They just know who I am, and they're like, what I do. But the community really, you know, it was amazing. And um, yeah, so and this is when Hector was still alive, too. Hector so. Oh, yeah. that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And he's in the movie, and Hector is a, a, a grand a gay grandfather of mine and Hector's been a mentor of someone I spoke to often. So yeah, so we did walk well for me. That opened up the door to my house. I took I and I we sold my house while I was still a student at Tish. That paid paved the way for me. So to answer your question, how did I become a filmmaker? I became a filmmaker by deciding that I belonged making films and going out and and building a community to make them with. Yeah. That is so beautiful. That is so beautiful. And I also love the fact that it's not necessary, necessarily something of like, I set out to do this, but my life experiences have brought me to this. Right. And I think that's beautiful. Vanessa, I want to bring you in because uh, the subject matter of peer kids is dealing with at risk queer youth. LGBTQ youth, Black, Latino, who are homeless, who are on the peers, and you work as, and I have to congratulate you on this because it's fantastic, a bilingual therapist at PFY. I want to hear what brought you to this work and like services that PFY offer. Sure. Um, so I didn't always start out knowing that I wanted to do the line of work that I'm in or just activism period. Uh, I just knew that I was a loudmouth Latina and that it had to be good for something. Uh, 
everyone else <laughs> since I was a kid my dad was like wow you should be a lawyer and I was like no I don't think I want to be a lawyer um but gender roles really played a very big life uh, part of my life you know growing up being a, a feminine latina in a household being told like this is the box that you have to stay in and you're not allowed to go outside that box um so it was a lot about me breaking through those gender roles for myself and setting goals and expectations for myself and i found that in education um and i specifically found that in mental health i had a wonderful mental health counselor in high school i went to school in queens we really didn't have many resources and she was just amazing and, and such a resource for us to talk to and i realized from one day to the next they cut the program um so a lot of the kids were really hurt that they didn't have that resource especially in the area that we were in, we really didn't have access to mental health or we couldn't speak to our parents about our mental health. So it that was really mental um, that they took that resource away from us. So I started realizing like, hold on, that's not fair. Um, and then in high school, I have this awakening of this bigger picture, right? Of like, well, there's a lot that's not fair. Um, and I think that really woke up for me after the pulse shooting. Um, I realized like, you know, why do they plaster certain things in the media about white faces, about non-queer faces? And how come nobody was talking about this? You know, it was like one or two mentions in a news article here and there, but like, why aren't people upset? Why aren't LGBTQ people more protected? Um, and at the same time, I was really denying that I was coming out. You know, I thought, no, I'm just an ally. I'm just an ally. Um, you know, so I'm trying to distance myself from my queer identity because like my whole life I believed like okay like th this is great for other people but not for me like this is not what I'm supposed to do like I have never met a successful queer person right that's like been out like I, I can't I can't do it if I come out it's going to change my life um and it was actually through my work at, at Pride for Youth like I, I walked in and it felt like home um I loved the staff I felt welcome I felt so uplifted and ready to learn and honestly ready to change lives like it was my first internship my first mental health counseling internship um but i realized like it, it didn't just stop there i ended up taking a lot of my work home with me um but in a good way i ended up doing a lot of research i ended up doing a lot of advocacy i've attended a couple of rallies i became really outspoken on social media like on my own social media um because for me it wasn't just a job it's not something that i go to a couple of times a week it was something that i wanted to do with my life right uh especially when we see so much anger and hurt and sadness come through our doors and it, it's funny that people in the month of june are like yeah th this is our community we love it rah rah rainbow um and then what happens to our kids in july right they get left what happens to them in august and september right. when they're bullied in school again that allyship goes out the window the paint on the glass comes down you see yeah. them slowly tearing it down no more yeah. flags no more stickers no more i'm safe pins right um but that's something that we live every day so my goal in advocacy is just to overall provide that safe space everywhere like you should go to the hairdresser and have an amazing time right like and feel affirmed and have them ask about your pronouns you should have an awesome nail tech you should go wherever down the street just to buy a drink and feel that safety that you would feel at an lgbtq center um so pride for youth opened in the 90s from an organization called the Long Island Crisis Center. They were receiving an influx of crisis calls specifically from LGBTQ youth who had no place to go that wasn't a substance-free environment. A lot of LGBTQ kids specifically in the 90s were going towards the ballroom scene and uh, clubs and bars and they found themselves gravitating towards places where alcohol and drugs were very common and many people felt uncomfortable and many people didn't want to do that, right? Um, so they decided to open this first group, this first drop-in center to be able to be that safe space, especially on Long Island, um, that is a heavy Republican and white dominated area. So no one dared to be out back then. Um, but we've come in and we've tried our best to change the culture and the climate. Uh, we provide free six month counseling. We don't ask for insurance. You absolutely do not need parents. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Um, which was something that was really dear to our heart because sometimes at 10 years old, kids know that they want counseling, but parents either can't afford it or refuse to get it for them because they feel like you should be fixing the issue, not celebrating my kid's identity or affirming my child. Um, so you don't need parents' permission when you come to us. We consistently hand out free condoms, free lube, free dental dams, internal condoms of all sorts. Um, so they're available in all of our offices around the building. We'll also mail them to folks' homes if they feel uncomfortable and they don't wanna come in for services. 
um, we do that. We consistently do drop-in counseling. So if folks want to come into our center, if they're in crisis or need to see a therapist, we'll try our best to get you one right away. Um, we started a food pantry. So if LGBTQ folks up to the age of 30 that live in our priority towns are in need of food, we have that food pantry. We provide free and confidential HIV testing, rapid syphilis testing. Um, for folks living with HIV, we could do case management services, HIV navigation services, so really helping you manage your life to show you that you can live a healthy and awesome life living with HIV, and here's how we're going to help you do it, because if we don't talk about it, it's going to stay stigmatized, right? Um, and something really awesome that I get to do is to go into schools and talk about gender identity and sexual orientation and being an ally, um, because especially in schools on Long Island, like a lot of folks are not exposed to this. So sometimes we have to be the first people to have these hard conversations because if people are never exposed to it, they remain ignorant, right? So we give them the tools to say, all right, go on and do your research because how many kids are sitting among you that identify this way, that you are not affirming, that you are laughing at jokes, that you are making feel uncomfortable, or you might identify this way like myself and not realize it until a bunch of years later. Um, so that's something really special that we get to do in the classrooms. And we do professional trainings as well so we'll go with we'll trained doctors. We've trained like 1-800 flowers, different organizations uh, on how to provide affirming services for their staff, how to change their language, um, pronoun usage, just simple questions about the community that you would be shocked that some people don't know. Um, so we want to be a resource to provide that, that education and that advocacy. So I'll go into schools and I'll fight for trans kids, you know, if there's something wrong with the bathrooms, if uh, they feel unaffirmed, paperwork, name changes, we could do gender marketing. I write letters for top surgery, bottom surgery, orchiectomies, anything of that nature, pretty much our organization can handle. That is incredible. I want to thank you so much for being with us because I think the work that you're doing is so necessary. Uh, and also, I think it's very important that we have both Elegance and Chester and you, Vanessa, here to talk because we are looking at the story of peer kids, which is a beautiful story, but it's also a story of kids who are begging for help because they've been kicked out, they've been pushed out, they've been abandoned. And often when we see movies like Pair Kids, it's like, oh, wow, this is so beautiful, but what next? Mm -hmm. And you, Vanessa, are providing that what next for people who are at risk. So I wanna thank you for that. We are going a little bit over. I just wanna ask you to hang on just a few minutes more for one more question. Um, how do you all, in the work that you do, which is powerful and needed. How do you take care of yourself so that you continue doing this work? I have no idea. I am um, literally, you know, I'm in the middle of making uh, my first feature film. It's about a homeless kid who joins the Marine Corps to change his life, but ends up falling in love with his drill instructor during the Inadonational Hotel. It's called The Inspection. And um, it's, Really, he goes to boot camp to win back his mother's love, which is why I went back to boot camp. And my mother recently passed. And I don't know, like I, I, something about filmmaking for me has to be healing and transformative, which requires it to be triggering on some level. Mm -hmm. So I am, um, I guess the answer to your question is, first of all, I don't know. Secondly, what I try to do <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a real answer. I mean, it's a real answer. <laughs> so what I try to do with this work is I really believe that my life experience has taught me a lesson that is valuable and useful for anybody who's not, even if you're not Black, gay, queer, trans, what have you, it's the importance of the person to your left and your right. And no matter who you are as a human being, you're going, you have to pee, you have to poop. So there's no reason for anybody to ever make me feel like I don't belong anywhere and I deserve to be anywhere I want to be. Um, so with that, I try to use the work as a way to, in a way it's activist work, right? Any, most of the rooms that, I, that Chester and I occupy to do what we do, we are the first people like us that have ever been in those rooms. So I try to remember that I'm not doing this just for myself, but I'm doing this for all those people before me who dreamt of this, who had the ability to do this, who because of white supremacy and capitalism have not been allowed 
to have that opportunity. And I remember where I come from. I, I remember what it's like to be invisible. And somehow, some way, this constant process of checking in helps me sustain myself while I go through the trials and the fires of using this artwork to keep, transform my trauma into this valuable lesson for the world. You know, we are all as important to the, as the person to the left and our right. And I believe that the mission of that work is healing in and of itself. But in terms of like, you know, I get manicures, I get pedicures, I play tennis. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? I, I eat chocolate when I want to eat chocolate. Oh, chocolate. Right, I, I'm back to smoking cigarettes for a little bit because I, I took a bunch of time off, but you know what? Addiction is a process. Mm -hmm. I'm stressed out. My mom just died. For instance, I'm making an apartment for my mom for this film that I make, sorry about that. I'm making an apartment for the film, The Inspection, that is my mom's apartment that I haven't been allowed in you know, I was not allowed in that apartment since I was 16 years old. So I'm recreating a space for memory that I've missed and longed for and, and tried so hard to find a way to be back in. And I'm grateful for the opportunity, like from a psychological standpoint, to rebuild that space of trauma. But at the same time, it reminds me oh my God, I had to be, look what I had to do to get back home, you know? And that is a really, um, it's just a lot to continue with. So I don't know how I come out of it stronger, but I know that I will come out of it stronger. And maybe that's, my community is that purpose. It makes me know that because of everyone who watched this movie at this festival, I have, people out there that have lived like I've lived and who support me and believe in me and that helps me. And I That's also want to, yeah, I also want to say I don't that, else. <laughs> I also want to say that um, from what I've been seeing, you also have Chester in your corner. And I have my, he's not I have my he's not only the producer, but he's also your partner. My partner, my life right. partner, my everything, like the most beautiful man I've I've still ever seen. Um, the kindest person I know, the most supportive person I know, the most patient person I know, one of the smartest people I've ever met, you well, know? So it helps, it helps, it helps. I, I, I can't lie, like, I wouldn't be where I'm at if I didn't find this love. And that, and that is something too that gives me, like I've been fortunate enough to come out the other side of the lies that I was told around, <clears throat> I, I grew up thinking being black and gay that I would never find love. I would never have a career. Like everything was built for people who were not like me. So, you know, I spent a lot of time when I was much younger, you know, doing drugs. You know, and mind you, enough, I don't really think there's anything wrong with doing drugs, but the reasons you do drugs are what you need to look at, you know? Yep. But all day, this was something I was not, my mother, when I, my, mama, my mother figured out I was gay, she would warn me that I would die of AIDS. And people like you die of AIDS, you die alone. You don't have a family, people don't support you. And you, how can you not internalize something like that when it's from your family? Mm -hmm. So I've been fortunate enough to come out the other side of that, to have chosen to live my life on its terms authentically. God has blessed me with someone that loves me as much as I love them. They're black, I'm black. You know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> yeah. my 13 year old self would be very happy with how this is so turned out. So beautiful, so beautiful, <laughs> <know>? so beautiful. <laughs> Anything you wanna add? I'm chapter. sorry. Yeah, I didn't probably. Yeah, yeah, I think for me, gratitude. I think every day that I like wake up, I realize more and more. Sorry. That like you know, through wisdom, the thing that you do for self care is reflect, and really like you know, get into everything that you've done, the good and the bad, and not take like everything so so seriously in a sense of like in a sense of like your mistakes, you know, don't, don't hold yourself to like, you know, sure. be kind to yourself, be kind to yourself, be soft like with yourself. all of those, you know, everything, every mistake that you make, you know, if you're still alive, you still have a chance to fix it and, you know, do the thing you want to do or that you feel like is the better thing to do or whatever. And I think that like, and I think that like, you know, have your reactions, be honest with yourself, be honest with people, you know, and just live your life 
stay close to God and mind your damn business. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's, and, I feel, and I feel like, and I feel like, you know, I drink plenty of water and stay hydrated. Yeah, and get your rest, like, go to sleep. But seriously, and I feel like, and I feel like, and like Elegant said, like, and I'm also so happy, like people like you creating these spaces and meeting people. Yeah. Yeah. And being able to hear other people's stories, being yeah. inspired by people. I think, you know, I, when I was growing up, I never, this was never an option for me. Like, you know, like Vanessa, everything that Vanessa does for people, like that wasn't an option for people like me growing yeah. up, you know? And it's like to, to have services like that now, to know that youth, have people like Vanessa who care about them and that care about like, you know, what they're going through. And, you know, people like us who make movies about them or people like y'all that program them in festivals and program their stories and validate them in that way. I think that, and even validating us and playing our story, I think that like, you know, yes. it's it's amazing and, and, and it's all community. And I think that's amazing. And, you know, that's, that's self-love too and self-care that's too right. because of, you know, I feel like those moments are moments of rejuvenation. Well, this moment is a moment yeah. of rejuvenation. Big time. You know? Big time. And a moment of reflection too in itself. Big time. That's why I had to be here. I couldn't let, I couldn't let this one pass me by. I had to make sure. And thank you so much for no. coming through. Thank you, thank you. Vanessa, I'm gonna ask you to bring it home. <laughs> sure. Well, they pretty much wrapped it up perfectly, but uh, I think self-care is a lot of community um, and a lot of us leaning on each other and not expecting um, us to have to be the educators all the time. I find myself oh my that, like as a, a, a Latina person, especially like a woman <laughs> identifying person from my experience, like you kind of take this role on as the mother, right? Like you have to nurture, you have to consistently make everything better and you have to make yourself smaller. Um, so self-care for me is not making myself smaller that like my voice is just as important as a white man's, right? Like my voice is just as important as a man's period. Um, so self-care for me is finding that like finding my space and knowing that sometimes I do take this work home with me um but I don't see it as a sign of weakness I see it as a sign of what can I continue to change because I do have an unspeakable amount of privilege for most things and I need to acknowledge that it's not an oppression olympics like I need to be there um for my brothers, sisters, and non-binary siblings in the community, and that it's not about whose struggle is worse than who struggle because if we do that an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind um, so I think we just need to keep fighting as a community and bringing things together instead of saying like, no, this problem sinks more than this problem. Because in reality, we're losing our siblings left and right. And we really can't afford to do that for, you know, just the future of our queer youth. We need them to see that people can thrive, right? And people can be queer and be 95. Like, I, I want to live that long to be able to show them that they can absolutely, I want them to surpass Amen. me. Right? Like, mm -hmm. I want Amen. you to do whatever it is you want to do. Be that doctor, be that lawyer, be that electrician and be queer, right? Like, be so much better than me um so that's my self-care well thank you all for this fantastic panel uh, i want to thank elegance chester and vanessa for coming through and blessing us with our wisdom they're a messenger for being with us our asl interpreter benny yamas our captioner corey dosti again you can catch pure kids until midnight tonight and then after midnight we're opening a journey of mona lisa and no hard feelings you can catch all that information on our socials prideful film that is with two l's and our website prideful.com Org. This is me, Isaiah, from the Prideful team, signing out. Thank you again, and have a good night. Have a good night, night everyone. Thank you. Stay blessed. Stay queer. Stay of I color. We love you. Stay alive. <laughs>